Hello everyone, what is up? I'm Ernie Costa, Microsoft MVP, and today we're gonna talk about Azure Stack HCI, what it is, what it isn't, and why it may be good for you and your organization. Microsoft Build is going on right now. And a lot of exciting announcements, a lot of cool things going on in Azure, but one very cool thing was announced that we're gonna get to later about Azure Stack HCI. I don't wanna ruin the surprise. May be interesting for some folks that uh, used to do a uh, Hyper-V server for maybe a home lab or maybe a small organization that doesn't want to have a massive cluster. I think you're going to like it. But first up, we're going to help the newbies out, help them explain what Azure Stack HCI even is in case they're not uh, familiar with it or maybe the, uh, the, the the terminology that's being thrown around is, is a little too wild. Uh, so I, I like to explain it by starting off by explaining what it isn't. And it definitely isn't just an operating system. Um, Azure Stack HCI is a, is, is a whole wrapped up service delivered like any other Azure product. Um, you're going to be getting billing. You're going to be getting updates more frequently on a faster cadence. You're going to be getting pay-as-you-go-esque licensing, and you're also going to be getting validated hardware. So it's not just a simple operating system that you're dealing with here, which is definitely something uh, unique when it comes to Microsoft, they're used to uh, either throwing out something that's bundled up like Hub or uh, a dedicated traditional SKU like Windows Server Data Center standard. So this is this is quite a different beast that we're dealing with here. Um, and, and it's going to allow Microsoft to rapidly progress and, and add new features at a faster, faster cadence. That's going to be a term you hear me throw around a lot, cadence here. Azure Stack HCI, when it launched, what was deemed build 20H2. Now that meant that the build came out in the second half of 2020. And then subsequently a year later, 21H2 came out. Those are terms you may be familiar with if, if you've played around with Windows 10 and Windows 11 uh, insider builds, or maybe you're, you're managing those uh, client OSs for your organization. Uh, Azure Stack HCI follows that same same naming scheme, except instead of it being a bi-yearly or uh, every six month release, it's once a year. So second half of the year, it seems to be that's what they're going with. So when we went from uh, 20 H2, 21 H2, we got a bunch of new updates. Um, I'm not gonna go into them in detail here, but things like uh, kernel soft reboot and improved storage spaces directory pair times, um, uh, VM self-service capabilities, meaning you can connect your your cluster and make it appear in uh, traditional Azure portal as its own custom region uh, instead of East US or, or maybe like a, a European region, it'll actually show up as a custom location and it's your actual data center. So that gives your, your, your employees or you or a customer the ability to provision VMs right to your own hardware without having to actually be on the hardware. You get all the Azure RBAC, get Azure policy with that, some really, really cool stuff. Um, that's just that's just what comes naturally with the update frequency, the update cadence. Um, the other big difference is the, the, the billing mechanism. And, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be cautious here how I how I phrase this. It's not that you get um, you get the, the, the workload licensing for free, but the actual operating system and feature set itself is a uh, pay-as-you-go model based on the number of physical cores you have on your hardware. Um, probably sounds familiar if, if you dealt with uh, traditional Windows Server data center licensing, except it's a monthly rate. Um, now, if you have Azure commitments or spends you got to hit or an enterprise agreement, maybe for whatever reason you have like thousands of these, these servers, you can negotiate a better rate that, than I can't get. Uh, with my one or two clusters I may be running, um, you can apply those because it is billed as an Azure service. So again, if you have some kind of yearly commit you got to get to, or you have uh, credits for, for education or something, um, you can use those to pay for this, which is pretty dang cool if you ask me, uh, especially if you're in the SaaS world or maybe you're an ISV that, uh, that does a lot in the cloud. Probably the, the most important part about all of this, and I'm not just saying this because um, uh, of a relationship with, with, with hardware vendors that, that I have, but the, the hardware itself can be delivered as a validated solution from a vendor. 
in other words, yes, you can download an ISO and you can install it on your own gear and put it on your own kit or run it on a VM just to test it. But you can also go to certified vendors that Microsoft uh, puts through a rigorous testing process and validation process to, um, to, to get a solution that actually works and, and, and has drivers and firmware that are going to be delivered that, that uh, isn't going to... Uh, <laughs> most likely isn't going to give you any grief. And I say it that way because if you're running public early previews, there's always that possibility, just like with Windows 10 Insider or anything like that. But for the most part, you're going to be getting a product and solution that is that not just validated and using hardware that, that they know shipped and worked, but also is going to be tuned to work for your workload. So when you work with your hardware vendors, make sure you uh, you specify what you're actually doing. Microsoft actually has a really, really cool to, tool online uh, to, to kind of give you a, a catalog of those solutions. Um, if you're running like a heavy duty SQL Server workload, if you're doing a VDI deployment, if you're doing Kubernetes on premises, uh, stuff like that. The, the, these vendors can, can give you pre-built solutions that are geared specifically for those workloads. Definitely cool stuff. Um, I don't want to leave you hanging on the MS Build announcement uh, announced yesterday early in the morning. Uh, single node Azure Stack HCI clusters uh, is generally available. And I know that's kind of like a misnomer there. <laughs> single node cluster that, that's literally uh, antithetical to the, the terminology itself. But uh, just deal with the nuance of it. What it means is you can now deploy Azure Stack HCI deployments it will still use failover clustering as the the guts and the orchestration of the um, of, of the various storage back end services but you can do it with one node in that cluster um, so yes if you're if you're trying to run a production workload that that needs to be highly highly available you're probably not doing this but if you maybe are a, a very small remote branch office that doesn't really need two servers because you're only running a handful of VMs or maybe you're just a home lab enthusiast and you want to run a bunch of Linux VMs and you don't want to pay out the butt for it. Um, this is a very, very viable solution. Um, definitely been tested by Microsoft over the past couple months. I know I, I've spoken to a few folks that have been running it in preview um, and it's, it's presented a lot of cool new features for them. One of them that comes off the top of my head uh, is a backup target type of appliance. So if you're uh, running some kind of immutable storage repository and you want to leverage uh, the, the latest uh, deduplication of features that Azure Stack HCI has, or maybe the, the, uh, the faster rebuild speeds, or, or maybe you just need one VM and you don't need this big solution that has a bunch of cores and memory, this is one opportunity for you. So um, definitely cool. We're going to post a link to that. Read up about it more. The official Microsoft blog will have uh, some some deep dives into it. Always check the Azure Stack HCI documentation. Feel free to comment below any questions that maybe we didn't get to, or maybe I tripped over my tongue and messed something up and you want to correct me. I'm always open for that. Uh, let us know what you want to hear next, and we look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks very much. Talk to you soon.